So I've been racking my brain trying to figure out how to start a magic channel in a way that lets you know who I am, but also gives you something of a different perspective. Like I said, I'm a little late to the game. I think I got it though. So take a deck of cards, take it out of the box, set your hand flat, then take the cards and set them along your knuckles longwise, and just let them balance there. And then when you're ready, throw them over your shoulder and then go pick all of them up. Now, if you actually followed through on that first part, number one, God bless you. Number two, as you're picking them up, don't change the orientation. If they're face up, leave them face up. If they're face down, leave them face down, but collect them all into a nice neat deck and then set that deck in front of you. Now think about this. In all of human history and for the remainder of human existence, no other deck of 52 playing cards will randomly be in the order that the deck in front of you is in. Congratulations, you just made history, and you didn't even have to try. Let's talk randomness. Just as an aside, there's a storm rolling in for the first time ever in the history of Orange County, so pardon the moody lighting. If I asked you to think about the word randomness, what's the picture that shows up in your head? Maybe it's something small, like a coin flip or a rolling dice. Maybe it's something big and abstract, like Wall Street or Las Vegas. Maybe it's a particular example of something, like, did you know that you can just buy a llama online? You can just go to a website and buy a llama. <laughs> For me, it's a deck of cards, and I'll explain why in a little bit. Now, all of those examples have randomness built into them, but the type of randomness and to what extent very, very much depends on the type of questions that you're asking about each. Let's take the coin toss example. Imagine I was in front of you and I said, I'm going to flip this coin and I want you to tell me what the likelihood is that it will land heads up. Instinctively, you might say 50-50. In fact, that concept is even built into our language, it's so familiar. If two outcomes are equally as likely and we don't know what's coming, we might call that situation a coin toss. Same thing goes with the phrase, a roll of the dice. The concept is the exact same. The only difference is the number of possibilities we're referring to. Now, I don't think that we use those phrases because we're all a bunch of math nerds thinking about probability theory. In fact, I think it's the other way around. I think we all take our collective experiences and use them as a framework to understand the probabilities that we're talking about. Coin flip is easy. We've all had situations where we don't know what's coming down the pipe, but there's really only two ways it's gonna go. Is it gonna be a good day or bad? Will it be sunny or cloudy? Will I get to go to magic camp or not? She loves me, she loves me not, she loves me, she loves me not. But that framework starts to break down if the numbers get even slightly bigger. When someone says, oh, it's a roll of the dice, I don't think that they mean that there are 36 different possibilities and only 11 outcomes, and some of those outcomes are more likely than others. Nerd alert. I think what they mean is that there's a whole bunch of possibilities, all of them equally as likely, and we don't know which one's gonna show up. And this is a super important point because everyone does this. You, me, your grandma, all of us. We all take our life experiences and wrap them around complex things to simplify them and make them easier to deal with on a daily basis. It's called a heuristic, and no one is immune to it. The only problem, or advantage, depending on how you're looking at it, is when someone assumes that the simplification is the reality and not the complex thing that it's based on. And this is one of the things that makes what we as magicians do possible. So what if I asked you to try to take your life experiences and wrap it around all of the possibilities of that deck that's in front of you? It doesn't work because the numbers get astronomical in a hurry. If we were just talking about the values and all the orders a deck could be in, that's 52 factorial. That's a huge ass number. If I round it down, that's eight with 67 zeros after it. That's so many zeros, we run out of cutesy Greek names to call all of them. So we shall call that number eight godzillion. But some of them are face up and some of them are face down. So if we ignored all the values and just talked about the flippy floppy part between 52 cards, that number is still huge. Even if I round it down, it's still 4.5 times 10 to the power of 15, which is 45 with 14 zeros after it. That's massive. Not as big, I get it. But we shall call it 4.5 King Zillion. Kong Zillion. King Kong Zillion. 4.5 King Kong Zillion. So if we're talking strictly the deck in front of you and all of the possibilities that it could have taken after you threw it over your shoulder and had to pick it up, it's eight times 4.5 Godzilla versus King Kong Zillion. You're welcome, Warner Brothers. That was a lot of buildup. That number is bigger than the estimated number of atoms in the observable universe, which means we don't have a scale in reality to match a number that big, and yet it's sitting right in front of you. 
So what does that mean to the average magician? It means that now every time you shuffle the cards, you know that you're dealing with astronomically large numbers as far as randomness is concerned. But to the average observer, they're likely leaning on a heuristic that massively oversimplifies what's actually going on in front of you, which means you can get away with murder. Tell you what, let's run an experiment. I'm gonna take out a deck, remove it from the box, split it as close to half as I can get it, and then give it a nice even shuffle. And then I'm gonna square everything up and set it down in front of me. Now, based on what you just saw, what can you tell me for certain about the deck? Before you answer, let me just ask you a couple of questions. Was the deck new or used? Was it shuffled before I took it out of the deck or was that the first time it ever been shuffled? When I separated the two packets, did it look perfect? Where was the top card before the shuffle and then after the shuffle? Does shuffling a deck of cards once actually mix it? I'll just give you a hint, it was a brand new deck. I had already popped the seal and taken out the jokers and the ad cards, but other than that, I didn't touch a thing, which meant the deck was in new deck order. So black, red, black, red. When I split the deck, it was perfect. And I made sure by knocking the ends together to measure, make sure that one side wasn't higher than the other. When I gave it a shuffle, I didn't do anything weird with that. It's just, I have a tendency to always drop the bottom card first and the top card last. It's just a quirk of mine. So now knowing all of that, we actually know a whole hell of a lot about the deck in front of me. You could probably figure out this next part based on what I told you, but we'll go through it anyway. Because I dropped the bottom card first and the top card last on a brand new deck, it means that the top and the bottom card are aces. Because it was a brand new deck and I shuffled it once and the shuffle was pretty even, it means the majority of the deck is separated into red and black. And that even if that separation weren't perfect, I know that there's a better than even chance that I have a really rockin' poker hand sitting smack dab in the middle of the deck if I'm willing to cut to it. So in answer to my previous question, no, a single shuffle generally doesn't mix the deck very well. Now, the guy who gave us the vocabulary and the mathematics to intelligently talk about how shuffles affect the randomness of cards is a guy named Percy Diaconis. Percy is a badass. Percy used to take on casinos with the likes of Claude Shannon, the father of information theory, or Edward Thorpe, the guy who wrote Beat the Dealer. Fun fact, he also used to study magic under Di Vernon. That's right, the professor of close-up magic. So, badass on a lot of fronts. Now, he wasn't the first person to study shuffles, but he definitely took us the furthest. He wrote a paper where he gave a mathematics to that style of shuffling that you saw me do. And he proved that it takes about seven shuffles to get rid of all of the potential patterns in a well-ordered deck of cards. That's a lot of room to play with. And lucky for you and me, he co-authored a book with a guy named Ron Graham, where he talks about all of the order and randomness inherent in a deck and how magicians can play with that. Now, the book is not easy, but it is absolutely worth it. I'll leave a link in the description below so you can find it. So after all of that, thanks for sticking around. I realized that video was a bit long and maybe a bit abstract, but randomness for how abstract it is, is also weirdly useful. You'll find that out if you ever study Percy's work. To the over 500 people who subscribe to my channel after only one video, thank you. It means the world to me. If you guys have ideas about stuff that you want me to cover in the future, just go ahead and put it in the comments below. This channel is going to change largely based on your feedback, and I'm happy to hear it. Anyway, I'll see you guys soon. One of the cards stuck to the wall after I threw it. It's the three of spades. Was that the card you were thinking of?